Jenny to come on up, yes. Um, we're going to have a very brief um, session for the panel. Um, and to introduce Liz, although I think she needs no introduction, uh, she's a senior strategist of outreach and communications for Open Notes, which is an international movement dedicated to making health care more open and transparent. Um, and as we all know, Open Notes is not a technology, but a movement, um, but it is indeed powered by technology. Um, one of the things that I found out about speaking to all of our panelists is that we're all connected, um, despite the topic being technology, we're all connected through art and music. Uh, so I said Auden was a classical saxophonist. It turns out Kirsten and Liz are both punk rock drummers. Uh, <laughs> and we have uh, other art connections. Um, and so um, anyway, uh, with that background, I just wanted to ask um, each of you to offer a brief comment on your journey and how you got here. Let's start with Liz. I have no microphone. Don't know if I need one. Um, so I'm the person that joined the panel that you didn't see present, uh, though I did a great workshop yesterday with Dr. Chapin uh, Sarabu on Open Notes, and thanks for explaining a bit about Open Notes. Um, you know, I, I did want to actually ask, I know our, our panel is going to be a little bit long, but I did want to ask Auden a question or, or comment on what Simpler is all about and it's really interesting. So I, I happen to be funded with a few other patients who are here in this room on a project um, by Macquarie. And we are actually using this, the free version of the Simpler tool to conduct some research for our project to get feedback from the patient and clinical community on a research project around palliative care and glioblastoma. And it's such a great and amazing tool that you have a free version where projects who are like ours that don't have too much money can use. I'm also a person living with an astrocytoma, which is a malignant brain tumor. And I, along with the two, two others of my patient colleagues in the room, have formed a patient community that we're able to use a hashtag, hashtag BTSM, brain tumor social media, to engage with each other and develop community, and also download transcripts of our conversations and learn from each other about what is most important to other people in our patients' communities. It's really cool. But after listening to Kristen's presentation about um, what is happening with health data and all of the interesting things going on around Facebook. Um, I'm just curious about, you know, how, you know, you got to pay the bills too with what you guys are doing. How are you able to fund the work that you're doing with Simpler? I know there's a paid version and um, what should we be aware of around what people are getting from reading our conversations that we've made open to the world? Right. Thank you for that question. So, um, uh, which, is, which is very uh, timely, uh, because we, we're a company, we build a tool that sits up on top of the tool, so on top of the platform, we analyze public uh, conversations um, that has to do with health. Um, so right now, that, that's a little bit uncomfortable, right? I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> Got to admit it. Uh, at the same time, though, um, because what we're trying to do is that we're taking the technology that has actually eleva elevated the, the patient voices, and we're kind of trying to synthesize those things and put it in the face of people who are decision makers or otherwise would be able to make a difference. Um, we're building that tool. And if we're, if we're somehow, if, if this pendulum swings to the other side and we can't, we can't touch patient conversation anymore, then we actually will be put back decades and again we're going to be totally ignoring patients. Okay, you're saying something over there, but I'm going to block you. I'm going to wipe out your record because I can't, I can't listen to you. And I think that will be like extremely bad for all of us. What we're trying to do is to take these patient voices and, and, and make them heard. Uh, and you need some tools to do that. And uh, no one is able to read all the tweets and whatever. You need to synthesize it. Um, and so, so that's, that's um, what we're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, let me grab that. I have a question for uh, Elizabeth, which is um, we all have our own intersection with art. Um, and we all have our own intersections with technology. So what is an idea that you have that we can bring art and technology together? in education. Uh, 
I first want to say, could you please fill out the conversation cards? <laughs> it's really important that we, I have your view of what music comes to mind with healthcare. I filled out the conversation card and I wrote Highway to Hell, which is my um, spunky response to my being a patient. And we're talking about the internet and I'm talking about um, old fashioned words and written words. So I think there's a need for both in building community. So please fill out the conversation cards. I really appreciate it. Um, I think there's a role for art in communicating a deep message that's, that technology is, pre is presenting us. I'm working with a physician at Harvard now involving poor children in Bangladesh and where, where he's tracking the neuroconnectivity of infants and the stunt, stunted growth of infants who are poor and not nourished. And I, I he and I are trying to come up with an art piece that hopefully can go to the World Bank. So it's very creative. Art can be a very creative and attractive way to, to publicize important work that are done in laboratories and um, neurotechnology centers. And also art can humanize of um, what patients are going through, what physicians are going through. So I think that um, there's so much could be done with art and education. Question for you, Christian. So um, really fascinating talk. What do you think Facebook would think of this critique? Um, should I, I can use this one, that's fine. Um, uh, I don't think they want this conversation to be happening. Um, I mean, they actually asked me to make a couple of corrections. If you look at the piece, it's kind of funny at the bottom. There's a few um, ambiguously worded corrections, I guess I would say, that um, basically state what Facebook wanted changed and um, uh, that they deny that they do this or they deny that they do that. So the, the editors do not really accept that they don't. Um, and I think part of the challenge is that, um, you know, I gave those examples of places like housing discrimination and police profiling that we know have happened, um, but we only find out about these things after the fact, when something really bad happens, right? And so, um, starting these conversations before something really bad comes into public uh, discussion, um, I hope, is a way of preventing that really bad thing from happening. But um, that also collides with um, their business model. So that's, that's kind of the crux of the issue right there. And so um, uh, they, they, you know, I, I think that um, a, a lot of technology companies are uncomfortable right now, right, and are, um, scrambling and, um, and may well want to do the right thing, but may also be faced with a situation where there is this kind of tidal wave that they are now trying to swim against and, and trying to figure out how to do that really fast. So, you know, one thing that I would really advocate for is if anyone is in a position to advise um, companies, you know, and to bring the, the patient voice to them, you know, the voice for um, openness, but also protection, ability to opt in, right, and transparency, um, please do. And if you're not in that position, um, please, you know, if you think there's a way to become in that position, please do. Um, because the, the, the conversation has to sort of bring in the voices of the people who have, in many ways, I think, most at stake. <laughs> <laughs>